numbers in a book, do those numbers have value? No. Okay. So for argument's sake, so if, if you've got an accounting book, mm -hmm. it talk, t talking about how many cars you've got. Mm -hmm. So you got one million cars. If the book burns, are you going to cry? Well, no, there's, there was no... What if your cars get burnt? Then you will cry. Will cry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the token is just a, a representation of something. Mm. So those numbers represent cows, mm. but they are not the cows. So if those numbers get burnt, man, who cares? It's the actual thing that you care about. But Bitcoin is a representation of nothing. <laughs> okay. But, yeah. You know, it's like, okay, it's like having imaginary, I don't know, cars or properties. If you have like a thousand imaginary properties, doesn't really matter. Like I mean, just just pretend that you're going to buy land, say in I can't remember the name of the planet, but it's something like twenty-four thousand light years away. Mm -hmm. So we are going to buy property over there. So we are going to create terms um, called uh, mo uh, mortgages. We're going to uh, it's called titles for it. Right. So, but what value does that land have on a planet that's twenty-four thousand light years away? Right. metric or value, right? But it's all imaginary. Yeah, yeah I guess, yeah. But uh, it has no practical purposes. Okay, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> okay, it's really just touching more just semantics, more so. It, it is about semantics, yeah. pretty much. Because if something is 25,000 light years away, when are you going to get there? Yeah. Exactly. Never. Yeah. No. Pretty much never. Yeah. So what are you going to do with that? So I, I, I've got a million square kilometers in this planet that's 25,000 light years away. Yeah. How valuable is that? Oh, oh. <laughs> you can't get there to begin with. No. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so we'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you those uh, one, th one, one million square kilometers for your house and all your property on Earth. Mm, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Would you accept it? No. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Oh you, you, you can sell it to somebody else, you know, this, it's limited, it will go up in value. There is no more land on that planet, and it's, it's a better planet than Earth, apparently. No, still not. Well, it's better than Earth, I mean, better, better climate, it's, uh, it's awesome. Yeah, but what's the point if you can't get there? You know? So what's the point of Bitcoin if you can never have it? You can never touch it, you can never smell it. Hmm. <laughs> no, no, uh, see, I, I'm thinking of like how the discussion of what currency is and what value okay. it has. Okay. And it's like it, trying to sort of overlap those two together. Okay, so what is currency? Currency is an implicit contract between the citizens and the government. It's an implicit okay. contract. It's a contract. Okay. Because when the government says you're going to pay, as taxes, you're going to pay for our services, you must use our currency. We will not use foreign currency. Okay. So you must get this currency, and the only way you can get this currency is from us. From us. <laughs> so you, you have an obligation. But yeah. with Bitcoin, on purpose, being decentralized, you don't, th there is no contract. So you cannot go to a miner and say, excuse me, sir, I pay this, like, what's, what's the exchange rate for this? It's like, don't talk to me, just go to the open market and sell it. So the, the miner disavows all responsibility for it mm -hmm. by design. Mm -hmm. So there is no contract there whatsoever. Okay. So then it becomes a speculative asset. Why? What's the reason why you buy Bitcoin? To make money. There is no other reason. There is no other reason. So it doesn't have what's called utility in, in terms of economics. So utility is something that satisfies a need, a want, a desire. So if you have all the Bitcoin in the world and you cannot essentially sell it, what would you use it for? You don't. You just want to sell it to make money. It's not beautiful. Like, you know, buy gold, you buy paintings, you buy music because it looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. But Bitcoin, 
Nah. <laughs> you cannot use it to build anything, so it's all speculative value. But the issue with speculative value, 100% speculative value, is that it depends on the mood of the people. So, if you can convince them to that it's valuable, it's valuable. But then if somebody thinks, oh, I don't think it's valuable, they go, oh, price goes up and down. So. Is that is that be similar to the you know to the economic bubble in in Holland with with the tulip you uh, know back to four hundred years ago? Pretty much, but tulips have what's called hedonic value. They're beautiful. Right, right. right. So th that is that is a price for. I mean, the hedonic value of tulips is relatively low. I mean, it's higher than a lot of other flowers. Yeah, you can also eat them as well. <laughs> in, uh, in case of extreme need, <laughs> then you can use them as fertilizer. <laughs> you can dry them and use them for fire to keep warm. <laughs> mm, if you sort of like a, a kind of ingenious, you can use them for uh, textiles, making clothes. So, <laughs> like you can use them for insulation. So they have what's called utility value. It's not great, but it's got some. <laughs> <laughs> but most of their value was made of a speculative value. Yeah. So, I've, anyway. Yeah, I've heard another side of, uh, you know, angle uh, that's provided by people that said the, the value of the Bitcoin is, lies within the people who, you know, spend the money on setting up the rigs, the money rigs and computers and everything. So they injected value into the Bitcoins. Ah. Is, that a is that a valid argument? Well, that's what's called a sunk cost. If you repaint your car, does that increase the value of the car? Does it? Well, <laughs> repaint it again. Repaint it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. How valuable is that car if you've repainted it a thousand times? Mm -hmm. You've spent the money, mm. but is the, car, is the car actually worth that much? The, after you repainted the first time, mm. you know, so if you buy a car and it's got perfect paintwork, no matter how many times you repaint it, the value is not going to go up at all, mm. at all. So a sunk cost does not increase the value of an asset, right? Because right. it's non-recoverable. So it's different if it's an um, a recoverable cost. So if you buy a brand new car, you can choose to repaint it, but that's not going to add value. But you can put um, seat covers. I mean, you can you can buy sort of like leather or gold seat covers. Then you can remove them and resell them because the cost is recoverable. It does increase the value of the asset. But if that if that cost can cannot be recovered and it doesn't add functionality, <laughs> nah. <laughs> so it will be interesting to see how that turns out. I reckon. Uh, a bit less than four years. Let's say uh, 30th of March, 2025. <laughs> okay, well, okay, that's that's the I'm getting. In, what do you call? It? That's the end of the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the end of Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> end of the Bitcoins. Okay, no problems. Oh, end of cryptocurrencies, right? End of crypto. Okay. End of crypto. Okay. They they might persist, but not. They they will no longer be significant. No longer, yeah. yeah, and it's all the all the government show, you know, all the government crypto is gonna come out, isn't it? Well, they're definitely pushing it, but there is a big pushback against that because of privacy concerns. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are major concerns that if they bring it out, it's going to have a negative impact on the economy. So then that is that basically, if it's if it's a proper uh, what's it called? Uh, what's it called? Uh, central bank digital currency. That's programmable. Yeah, yeah. That means that the government says, okay, now people under this age cannot buy alcohol, which is a good thing. Now, these people on uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, benefits. You cannot buy these products. Uh, we're going to give you a stimulus check, but you've got a week to spend it. If you don't spend it, that money is just going to vanish. Like you, you can. So they can control the money a lot more. Mm -hmm. So 
And I mean, in China, it's okay. It, it's not a big deal, but in say in the U.S., they're concerned that the people will have a big uh, what's it called uh, lashback against the uh, digital um, what they call Fed coin. <laughs> so they're really concerned. Mm. So the U.S. is seriously thinking, no, nope, we'll just leave it. <laughs> because they want they want to bring it out to sort of like uh, say like oh look we're doing what China's doing like we're we're at the leading edge of technology. Mm -hmm. Their concern is that it's going to have a huge um, uh, uh, impact on the economy. So, Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, Pe just wait and see. <laughs> People there have a guns. <laughs> that, that's another big issue uh, because like all over the world like people are starting to rebel against the government <laughs> so th that's why you're seeing uh, say like cryptocurrencies take off because a lot of people the, the main reason they're adopting it is because they distrust the government they mm. really distrust the government mm, 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 so, mm. but what they don't realize is that uh, say uh, stuff like bitcoin can be shut down fairly easily mm. Once you start, say, punishing companies for owning it, uh, nobody wants to be caught holding Bitcoin because you go to jail. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's going to sort of like push down the prices. So that's one thing. But if they want to shut it down technically, well, th there are ways. So uh, it's, uh, it's called the Border Gateway Protocol. So you can essentially put in a, it's like a firewall but you cannot use VPN to circumvent it. So you essentially partition the internet. If you partition Bitcoin, that means that Bitcoin will destroy itself because it's, it's part of the protocol. So when you partition a network, uh, that both um, partitions can keep on sort of like um, mining independently. But when they rejoin, the one that has spent more money or more energy mining, that one will survive and it will override the blockchain of the smaller partition. Can you see a problem with that? If you partition them intermittently, the smaller partition will always lose out. That means that people think, oh, we've we got Bitcoin. And say if you rejoin them once an hour, in, in theory there will be sort of like, uh, maybe uh, like say three blocks will be lost every hour. And it can be very expensive for people doing the mining. Mm -hmm. So that's another way to kill it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially getting Bitcoin to, to, to do a 51% attack on itself. It's quite and devious, but. On who owns it, okay. Yeah. Because, um, like, say that people say, oh, it's it's very expensive to mount a fifty-one percent attack. Yes, if you want to mount it yourself, yes. Yeah. But if you partition the network, that's a piece of cake. <laughs> and partitioning the network properly is not that hard, especially if you're a government, and you can tell your ISPs. Yeah. Partition the network. But once you have in the whole, once you have the whole private sector, that's where things get competitive. Yeah, but the, th the thing is, if you're the government, you, you can tell Telstra, yeah. uh, uh, Virgin, that's it, this is a government order. No, yeah. Yeah, and they will comply. Because mm. otherwise they'll get shut down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. It's very interesting. The only example I've heard of the 51% attack was from the show uh, Silicon Valley. Sir, so, so what was that about the one? The show Silicon Valley is like some, it's like the startup company that did uh, some compression algorithm. Okay. It's a it's a completely fictional story. But like, mm, okay. But like they they made a they made a compression a compression a really good compression algorithm that just blew any sort of compression ratio <laughs> out of the water and then. I don't know. It's a several several season show. Okay. But it was it was really cool. But yeah, it was sort of held in it was it parodized. It parodied like a lot of cop tech things. Yeah, yeah. actually, um, see, like uh, I, I was telling you about that was a called Bit was uh, GBT minor. 
So that's the one with uh, the 2200, uh, 2250 terahash. I mean, that is just unbelievable. It's only possible if it's in China, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're, in, they're from Malaysia. Like, you, you can order them. Yeah, I think so. Well, I'll go check the website. Is there infrastructure solid enough? I don't know. Th these are just uh, the, the making the, those the acid miners. So, well, maybe they're made in China because they, 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 are, they keep, they're keeping a lot of secrets. Yeah, because fair of, enough. Yeah, uh, <laughs> trade secrets. <Yeah. laughs> it's understandable. But now the other concern is what's called uh, quantum computers. So these are not quantum computers. So can you imagine how fast quantum computers can become at uh, what's it called uh, like the, their hash rate? They, they could just like several orders of magnitude in like, a smaller volume. <laughs> yeah. So even if it becomes uh, like a you know, hundredfold, mm. like in that hundredfold keeps sort of like go, keep going up like every year, mm. every six months. <laughs> yeah. So uh, might not become viable because of the size of the blockchain. I don't remember how many gigabytes it's or terabytes it is now. The blockchain? The, 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 the actual, because you have to keep storing like the, all the information in the, in the blockchain. So you've got all the blocks that you're chaining together. Mm -hmm. You have to store them somewhere. So essentially, you have to download them, mm -hmm. unpack them, and do it throughout the history be, before you can verify it. So. Yeah. so, okay. so but, but then again, like storage might become cheaper and much, much bigger as well. But then, I don't then know how, how, what, what sort of technological advancements there are. But the question is, like, how quickly that they grow. So it will be interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. It'll be fun. <laughs> Just watch the wall burn. Maybe, maybe I should start sort of like a Facebook, um, sort of like a Bitcoin watch. And <laughs> <laughs> the Bitcoin show. <laughs> it's uh, it's I, I, entertainment. I think, oh, I'm trying to remember when, but it was 59. It was just, ah, I think, no, it was April. Sorry, it was after he went to, I think it was after he went to 64 because it dropped to about 49 and a half thousand. So it dropped 10 grand. Well, everybody's going like, we're going to 100K, we're going to 100K, we're going to 100K. To the moon, to the moon. <laughs> to the moon, to the moon, yeah. <laughs> But the reason is there was a lot of professional dumping. Uh, and if you know what you're looking for, it's easy to spot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, because a, a lot of people that invest in Bitcoin don't know a thing about economics. They yeah. don't know anything about finance. They don't know anything about trading. They, I mean, the, the, they come into it seeing it as free money. Yeah. That's, what it is. That's digital gold. Yeah. <laughs> digital gold, whatever that means. To uh, yeah, kind of always makes me laugh, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're always very sort of like euphoric mm -hmm. when good when news come out, positive news come out. They go, yeah, to the moon, to the moon. <laughs> but if positive news come come out and the price doesn't go up, you know there's something going on. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's true even for stocks. Mm -hmm. That's true for currencies. If positive news come out and the price doesn't reflect the news, that's what I call the reality divergence. <laughs> uh, they'll slap to the face, come back to reality, snap back to reality. Yeah, pay attention. This is what it is. <laughs> what you're seeing, that's your dreams. Yeah. Uh, was, it, uh, was, it, was it last week? Yeah, last week. When I basically, uh, I even put the time when it was going to crash. Okay. <laughs> and it did. Mm -hmm. it, uh, people it went, took it, that advice or huh? people took that advice? Or no, of course not, not because done. people don't believe it. Because uh, uh, it, it was going to expire on the 25th of June. The options are going to expire 25th of June mm -hmm. at 8 uh, o'clock uh, UTC. And I said, like, soon after the options expire, the price will crash because well, how was it called? It's called maximum pain. So maximum pain was close to forty thousand, and in spite of that, 
Bitcoin couldn't, but was staying at around 35. So, uh, uh, so but the, the guys who's interested in the options, so they want to manipulate the price up to get the maximum profit, or basically exert the maximum pain on, on uh, what's it called, uh, on um, option buyers. Right. So when the when the options expire, they get the ma the, the the big guys, the institutions get maximum profit, mm -hmm. and the retail uh, buyers they experience maximum pain, and that's why it's called maximum pain. Ah, uh, okay. I thought, so, <laughs> I thought it was spelled uh, P A N E, but no, no, no. It's -A pain as in, as in it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Okay. So they temporarily push the price. To, to the point where they can extract maximum profit or maximum pain. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So, and so the, it was in their interest to keep the price up. Mm -hmm. So once the options expire, they have no interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. So you can see the price coming down, and then within a couple of hours, the price started coming down. <laughs> uh, hit uh, about 29 and a half, so it scared a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it'd be dumping immediately. So that there are little things that if you know how how reality works, you, you mm -hmm. kind of tell. Like uh, sometimes people, you know, the crowds can be very emotional. Like they can distort the market temporarily, mm -hmm. but only temporarily, because very soon they'll turn onto each uh, onto each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's fun. Mm -hmm. ah. I want to get into it, but it's a lot of. There's a lot of reading, uh, yeah, just case study analysis. No, all you have to think about it, it's like uh, so sometimes a lot of stuff you can prove by contradiction. You, you can make an assumption okay. and then follow through logically. And then when you come back around, you'll see whether your original assumption was right or not. Okay, so it's like a, an experimental approach too. Yeah, but, but you can do this with, with like logically. So, I'm sure you, you've done uh, proofs by induction, proofs by contradiction at uni. Remind me what that is. Uh, so basically, like you assume, like say that uh, that, that certain thing is true, mm. and assuming that then this thing is true, then this other thing must follow, then this other thing must follow, then this tells you that your original assumption. For argument's sake, you assume it had a particular value, or that it was true, or, or whatever. But then, when you come follow the logic all the way around, mm -hmm. you get the opposite value, or a completely different value. Then you know, yeah, they cannot be true. Mm. No, I don't. I don't think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we were punished with a lot of those exercises. That you know. that, that does sound painful. Uh, yeah, and then that we were all like a, a math and like. Uh, Assignments involving yeah, and then the lecture proof or so the, show theory. And we will ask the lecturer for some help, and the lecturer goes, "Oh, by inspection, the answer is this." And you go, like, <laughs> "Seriously, by inspection, how can you tell?" Later on, you sort of like uh, you get there yourself, but it, sometimes it takes years. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I got my lectures were a little bit more grounded with engineers. Uh, no, but, uh, not 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 so much with uh, uh, the uh, At UQ, we're given a lot of math. Mm -hmm. We actually had to do a, a form a, a logic like a formal logic class. Mm -hmm. This is just about mathematics and logic. Yeah, logic principles. Logic in the sense of. As in, like, say, implication rules and things sort of, mm -hmm. like. So, and you just talk about all the mathematics <laughs> specifically, or? Yeah, this this was math. This okay. was part of math. Like, wow. I think. Uh, oh yeah, that, that that was a tough subject. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's it called? Um, what is it the end that we did? Uh, it was it was some sort of electronic design, but it was. Um, it, it, um, we, it was. Uh, it had to do with logic, so we had to use uh, what's it called sequential logic, uh, com uh, combinatorial logic. So, uh, I'm sure you do kernel maps. Kernel maps. 
cardinal cardinal maps for oh, like cardinal maps ah. for simplifying logic yeah yeah yeah, yeah the okay. Morgan laws like you draw grid of like yeah that's the, the one the bits and yeah you can derive like a like an algebraic expression of the yeah that's right okay. <laughs> yeah okay and then what's it called there was a uh, st uh, finite state machines. Uh, I, I, that seems really familiar. So it, it's like when you go, you, you got several states and the conditions from transition from one state to another state. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we did a, a, a way of simplifying it. But I cannot even remember most of the stuff, but I remember there, there were ways to simplify it. So. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's one thing I want to remember is simplifying. Yeah. Boolean equations. Oh, what's they were really cool when they did them. Boole Boolean logic, so that, that that there are specific rules that you can use mm -hmm. to simplify logic. Like the, the Morgan's rule. Yeah, so it's, there's the Morgan's law, there is um, it's called idempotence. Uh, I'm trying to remember that there are quite a few rules. They're really, they were really cool when they used first. Yeah, time. absorption. So, and so that, those ones I remember. There's sometimes I don't remember the names, but I know how to do that. Yeah. But simplifying uh, what's it called um, transition tables, that's a different ball game. Transitions as well, like now you're looking at transition. So, so sequential logic. So uh, like say you can you can do the logic say for a, for a, for an RS flip flop, JK flip flop, T flip flop, D flip flop. <laughs> so yeah, one, once you got feedback into a system so you, you have memory uh, so that, that's how you can uh, you, say using uh, NAND gates or, or NOR gates you can actually uh, construct a, 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 an RS flip-flop or a T flip-flop or a D flip-flop you can store like a bit you can store bits mm -hmm. so simplifying that that's that's different <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember seeing the, those subjects for the first time and it's like they do that for like registers and everything and we have like gigabytes worth of them now yeah, yeah. okay yeah. <laughs> now we have an even greater appreciation for them yeah, but this is just memory but you, you can have a what's it called a sequential logic mm -hmm. and, and that stuff it's powerful mm -hmm. but it can be hell <laughs> <laughs> When, so when things don't work, it kind of works sometimes, and other times it doesn't work depending on, on your initial state. So because you have stuff that's called don't care states, and then you've got some states... Um, these, really, these terms are not sound really cool. <laughs> it's frustrating. I'm sure you've done it. Don't, I don't mm, uh, states machine, don't care, so things yeah. like that, they, they ring something in my head. I'm, I'm sure you've done it. I'm sure every engineer does it, but it can be very traumatic to some people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I, mean, I actually enjoyed Boolean algebra. Was, the hard part is remembering them, I think. A Boolean algebra was fun. Sequential logic, that was a different story, I tell you. <laughs> I don't think I did sequential logic. I'm sure you've done it. I mean, you're like... You, you did JK, like uh, RS flip-flops? Yeah. T flip-flops? D flip flop T toggle. So I uh, must call what what's the uh, uh, what is the oh jeez uh, thank you do do they keep do they keep their last state? I'm trying to remember what's the difference. Hmm, I'm gonna have to have a look at uh, what a D flip flop is. <laughs> I remember the flip flops now. Hmm. I remember the T for toggle. I remember the RS and, and the JK, they're pretty much the same, or very similar except for uh, what's the definition when, when you got both um, S and R on, I think the JK flip flop goes to zero, gets reset, and I think the RS is undefined, so that, that I think that's the only difference. But in the industry, they're just called RS flip flop, which I in reality JK flip flops, so it's just a Technical difference. Mm. So. Ah. Yeah. so maybe I should go and review sort of like a sequential 
a design or simplification of sequential logic. <laughs> I, I've never done that. Simplification of sequential logic. Yeah, we, uh, I think one of my programming languages, SFC and Unity Pro, mm -hmm. I avoided. <laughs> I just don't like it. No, the, the, uh, that's, that's the thing because there are the, if you don't look at all the states, you can become trapped. Mm. Okay. <laughs> So if, if for whatever reason you start in certain states, they are really don't care states, but you don't have a way out of them. Yeah. <laughs> and then you suddenly like keep switching off and switching on until it works. And then one day it won't work and you won't know why. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, fun and games. Second of, uh, control systems because I've only done the first one. Oh, look, there's a lot of stuff that I wish I had paid more attention when I was at uni. Mm, I mean, yeah. some stuff I actually learned after the exam, after the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, geez, if I had another another three hours, which was the length of the exam, to study it, I would have done really well. <laughs>